Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. I wrote down in big notes here, trigger warning, because I start any talks on this subject with a notice reminding people that this can be disturbing, whether or not you've experienced it, but especially if you've experienced it. And saying, obviously, remember that you can stop listening at any point and return to it and remember to take care of yourself. Hi. So first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute and the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity. I'm researching how people abuse technology for coercion and control in intimate relationships. So cybersecurity in the context of intimate partner violence, looking at the ways in which people abuse technology to dock their partners or to coerce or control them through image-based sexual abuse or surveillance. I'm looking at how technology producers and people who maintain technology can anticipate and respond to these forms of abuse. More broadly, how feminist theories and practices can inform technology design. Some of the solutions that I'm exploring are drawing on participatory methods, both for research and design, and a concept called abusability, expanding security to think about abuse. Perhaps we could start with abusability. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Where does it come from? What are you interested in? Abusability is a concept that comes from Ashkan Sultani, who used to be at the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S., He coined it in contrast with conventional concepts like security or usability. Conventionally, usability is how easy it is for a user to navigate a technology to use it, how intuitive the design is to accomplish whatever their ends are. Security is thinking about how to stop people from penetrating a system, exfiltrating data, or for using it in a way that wasn't intended, in a way that causes risk or harm. Abusability shifts that to think not just about how someone might hack a system, but how someone might use a system broadly in the way that it was intended, how the features were meant to be intended, but in a way that causes harm to someone. For example, if you think about the app Find My Friends, Conventional security may have thought about how someone completely external to the system might hack into the system and get everyone's locations. But abusability would think about how someone might use that app to spy on their friends or family by coercing them to share their location and then using that knowledge to monitor them constantly, make them feel watched, control where they can and can't go. And it flips usability on its head because we tend to think that technology should be as easy to use as possible. But in this case, we want technology to be less easy to use for certain people for certain ends. How have you approached the challenges within your research? I think that's such a great question. And thinking through challenges in your research and conversation with others is just really valuable to do. One big challenge that I've been grappling with constantly and actually keep returning to, even when I've thought I've moved away from it, is that the basic framing of a lot of technology research, thinking of us being in the cybersecurity program, research questions tends to be, how can we make technology better? I've taken on that, thinking through the concept of abusability, which is very much like, how can we design better technology? But I think a lot of complex social problems can't necessarily be solved by technology. And so striking a balance, there are really fundamental problems in how technology is being designed and it contributes to the problem. But at the same time, not framing the solution as we need better technology, we need more technology, we need better funding for technology is really hard. The biggest changes to the broader problems of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, gender-based violence need to come in how we allocate resources, allocating better resources towards care systems like domestic violence advocates, shelters, better housing in general so that people aren't stuck in abusive relationships because they depend on it for their housing. On another level, education about things like consent and prevention. In a PhD about technology, risks reinforcing a kind of technological solutionism that is out there and that can maybe distract from those real solutions. Beautifully put. It really is. What is it that you are curious about? What I've been really curious about in the past few months is care practices of advocates who support survivors of domestic violence on the front lines. 
places like domestic violence shelters. I've also been speaking to people from the traditional technology space, to like software engineers who've taken this on, supporting survivors, people in the digital privacy rights space who've taken this on, even people in hacking collectives who've decided to make this their focus, who aren't at all in the traditional domestic violence space. Something really interesting is happening at the intersection of those very different forms of expertise. On the one hand, cybersecurity expertise of people who think about systematically modeling and responding to technology threats and building safer systems. And then on the other hand, the care expertise of people who think about trauma, healing from trauma, protecting yourself from the vicarious trauma that comes with working with people who are traumatized. That group of people is suddenly having to learn about VPNs and password managers just because it's increasingly a part of what they're seeing in their jobs. Tech people are having to learn about trauma and learn about care. It's really hard to disentangle those two kinds of knowledges. When you're helping survivors, you, you kind of need to have both. The security that comes out of that is really, really different to the conventional way that we think about cybersecurity. One thing that's come up again and again in my interviews, which I think is so interesting, is that a lot of times local like advocates will build relationships with local, for example, tech support at their Best Buy or local mechanics, reaching out to them and explaining domestic violence, the kind of situation that survivors are in, their specific needs, so that if, for example, they have a survivor that's experiencing stalking, they're able to refer them to the mechanic so the mechanic can search their car for trackers. That's a skill that mechanics have because they know how a car works and where it's easy to hide something in a car. Just having that knowledge isn't enough to help the survivor because if you don't have that training and understanding, you might recreate a system where you tell a survivor that they're being crazy or treat them in ways that can re-traumatize them. Building those relationships and those networks of care in the local community is a really interesting way of doing cybersecurity or digital security. How have you seen the dynamics around abusive technology change in the context of the pandemic? Unfortunately, the pandemic affected people living in abusive relationships, particularly cohabitating with their abusers by trapping them in homes while simultaneously a lot of the services that support them, like counseling, like advocacy, were forced to close and then struggled to adapt to online services, particularly in situations where there is technology abuse, where people's devices are being monitored. How do you provide services? That's a problem that domestic abuse advocates have been on the forefront of, but it actually affects every single online service. If you're setting up online counseling, you need to be thinking about the people that you're providing online counseling for. Similarly, for court systems that have moved online, there was a case in the US where it was recorded on camera that a survivor who was trying to give testimony was being intimidated off camera by an abuser. And so accounting for that domestic abuse situation has to be a part of security practices. It will always be the case that some people will be trapped in a domestic situation with an abuser. So I think that's in general a really important thing for online services to consider. People have found really creative ways to approach it, incorporating some level of checking at the beginning of an online conversation. Are you alone in the room? Do you trust this device? Offering as many different service options as possible. So offering both an email option, a text option, a phone option. It's a really mentally straining situation for both advocates and survivors to be in, knowing that for some people they just won't have a safe space, but you still need to provide those services. Would you describe it as a particular threat to be modelled or the way that we think about risk, the way that we think about how we're designing these systems? Do you think that needs a bit of an overhaul? Yeah, I've used the language of threat modelling in my work a lot, and I found it quite an intuitive way to explain what's happening in terms of technology designers and security experts will understand, which is that whenever we design a technology, design a service, and also generally in everyday situations, we'll have certain models of threats in our mind and intimate partner violence for a variety of reasons just doesn't get considered. Thinking about the threat model, understanding it and incorporating it is an important part of the solution. Although Threat modeling as a process can have downsides as well. Becky Kozinski has written a really interesting paper talking about threat modeling with activists and different communities that are targeted by state surveillance. I've done workshops doing participatory threat modeling with different communities, including activists. 
what she's described is that it can be this overwhelmingly negative process, thinking through every single thing that can go wrong, every single thing that's threatened, without pairing it to positive values or the positive things that you're aiming for. Psychologically really challenging. There are modes of being that are quite anxious and part of the way that security maybe is as a field. Always thinking about risk isn't necessarily the best thing to do if you're trying to create change in the world or heal from trauma. Finding ways that the intimate partner violence threat model is considered and is incorporated, but doesn't necessarily require those who are most at risk to be constantly dwelling on and explaining those risks is really important. I'd like to jump back a little bit to something you mentioned in your elevator pitch in your intro, which is that you applied feminist theory to your work. Would you mind just giving us a quick overview of what it means and what it doesn't mean? Initially, what kicked off my thinking about threat modeling was quite inspired by a set of feminist critiques of international relations theory and security studies, which thought about a binary in the way we understand the world of personal and political. It's quite an old feminist slogan that the personal is political. That binary will change how we think about the world. Cynthia Enloe talks about how we think of international relations as something that happens, you know, at the level of the UN or nation states, usually men in suits debating the end of a war or invasions of one country by another or trade or economic relationships. We wouldn't necessarily think of international relations as something that happens at a plantation in the Bahamas owned by a multinational corporation and the workers who work there or a camp of sex workers in South Korea outside of a U.S. military base and the ways that power is exercised there. We wouldn't think of that as security. We wouldn't think of that as international relations. And so she chose those kinds of sites as a a way to study international relations rather than diplomatic negotiations. A very similar thing happens in cybersecurity when we think of cybersecurity as something that happens within, you know, businesses, militaries defending their assets, states spying on each other or penetrating each other's networks. But don't think of cybersecurity as something that happens at the level of teenagers sexting each other and sharing those images non-consensually. Similar moves towards separation and moves towards binaries will happen. So I remember at the beginning of my time at the CDT, I would ask people whether they thought non-consensually shared images were a cybersecurity issue. And they would say it's a privacy issue or not really answer the question. I've learned since then that there is a whole community of privacy engineering that does care about privacy a lot. And this isn't to discount them, but I think the way the idea of privacy will be used is as a code to say, this isn't serious security research, this is a fuzzy other thing, which is a problem because in practice that will also mean that in cases of image-based sexual abuse, non-consensual pornography, the response will be, oh, you shouldn't have shared that image in the first place, rather than how do we build better, more secure technology that gives you more control over your images, which is what we do for companies, right? We, we would never tell a company, don't share so much sensitive data. We think about how we can build better technology for them. Feminism is, you know, theoretical approach. It's an activist movement. It means a lot of things to different people. One thing that started happening in recent years, which I think is really helpful, is to think of feminisms rather than a singular unified feminism. It draws on ideas of plurality or intersectionality that, depending on other identity factors that you have, depending on where you come from and stand in the world, what feminism means to you and the feminism that you practice will be really different. Although, as a side note, I think that's also true for many other academic theories or political movements. Words like liberalism or socialism will mean very different things to different people. It's a wonderful thing to be getting input from people who are not us. As researchers, there's a contract with society. As researchers, we have incredible privileges not afforded to everyone. So by privilege, I'd mean if I ask someone about their personal life or cybersecurity habits, they're more likely to tell me because I'm a researcher and I've done ethical approvals and I've got the okay from my university. What does that look like? You did mention participatory methods. What does that mean? And why do we Mm -hmm. bother using them? Participatory approaches to research come from a lot of different areas. So it's something that's quite common in feminist research traditionally, also came out of activism in South America. There's been Scandinavian worker-based approaches to participatory methods. Traditional research will have these, again, binaries of expert researcher and then non-expert other 
audience. And so the expert researcher comes and studies and collects data about their subjects and writes it up using their expert knowledge. If it's a subject that doesn't involve humans like uh, computer science, then it's just experts studying it and then informing public policy decisions using their expertise. Participatory methods try to erase that binary, that hierarchy, or at least mitigate it a little bit, making sure that the relationship between researchers and participants is as equal as possible by trying to involve participants in your research at as many different stages of the research as possible. That can involve reaching out to people who are outside of research to frame your research questions. After data is collected, it, it can include reaching out to your participants and involving them in the data analysis process. So be like, what, what kind of patterns do you see here? And then it can involve joining your participants and in initiatives to help them improve their lives through education. Or if they're campaigning on a certain cause, you can think about how your research can better support that cause. There's a risk in being a bit too idealistic about it because thinking of their role as researchers, I don't think you can fully erase those differences and hierarchies. In terms of my own research, we were running digital privacy and security workshops with different groups, the general public, different activist groups, a group that represent survivors of image-based sexual abuse or environmental groups like Extinction Rebellion. And in those workshops, we tried to make them two-way, creating a safe community fun space rather than just lecture or teach about digital privacy and security. We first asked people about their threat models, what they were worried about, what they wanted to defend against. And in asking that, we were learning about their threat models. I mentioned earlier the psychological burden that I think threat modeling can impose on people. Sort of rather than just leaving them with that, we would then have a tech support session where we would have people on hand who would help people take action to address threats or concerns that they saw in their lives. We very much wanted those support people to support people. So rather than someone who's there as an expert to tell you what you need to do, just someone who's there more to help you access the resources that you need, sit with you as you download Tor and Google whatever issues that you're having with. Sometimes we didn't know the answers either, but at later stages in the project, I think we've been able to be even more participatory. So we're doing a project more in collaboration with one organization, which is called the Voice of Domestic Workers. And we're planning right now to do a kind of data walkthrough where some of the people who are in some of the workshops will come back and help us analyze the data. Like we'll walk through some of the data and we'll hear some of their responses and thoughts on it. Do you have any tips for keeping up to speed with cybersecurity in your space? In terms of keeping up to speed with technology, I've actually had a really good set of experiences with online conferences and online webinars. Like I think I'll joke sometimes about whether future generations will look back at this moment now and see it as the golden age of the webinar, which they probably will not. But there's a lot of really amazing and interesting work that's being put online now where you can hear conversations by people who have very different life experiences or approaches and their thoughts on online security and privacy. For example, RightsCon or uh, Usenix or Pep so privacy engineering practice and respects to be really amazing sources of learning about security and privacy. Where can our listeners find out more? How can they keep in touch with what's going on? Yeah, in terms of keeping up with my work, I've published a paper on participatory threat modeling, which kind of goes a bit deeper into the question of what do participatory approaches to threat modeling mean? And also to Claudine's earlier question, I've also published a paper looking at how intimate partner violence, specifically survivors who are in lockdown with their abusers, what we can learn from that threat model to build better digital security practices. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTNPod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.